Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it, and if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to Manage Vets Consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Bend. I am really tickled to have my guest, Dr. Clayton McKay, here with me today. Clayton and I met several, several years ago. We won't talk about how many years ago it was, <laughs> when he was so gracious as to invite me out to dinner one night when I was speaking in Canada. And uh, he is a veterinarian from Canada. He has been in this profession Oh, since 1970, but actually, I think probably longer than that, because I think his dad was a veterinarian, so he was raised in the profession. And so today, I want to talk to Clayton about his story, and then also, maybe uh, let's talk a little bit about the perspective of uh, where we are in veterinary medicine. I know that sometimes looking back over a really long career gives you some great perspective over where we're going into the future, and Clayton also has been the, um, uh, uh, you know, an international speaker. He has presented at the, um, every conference that there is. He worked for Hills for many years in an executive position. He has been a teacher at the veterinary school. And right now, because he realizes that our profession is struggling, he has come out of his sort of semi-retirement where he picks and chooses his work and is actually working in a veterinary hospital doing wellness care uh, just to help the profession that is so shorthanded and struggling. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that too. So Clayton, thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you for your time uh, and your, um, uh, your knowledge. I'm excited to share you with my audience. Thank you, Deb. And I, before we talk about that, I'd like to congratulate you uh, as uh, the new president of the of Vet Partners, which is very exciting for us. I just actually filled out and, and voted or, or approved that your, your uh, move to that position. But thank you for doing that. It, you're, you're quite welcome. You know, I love that association, and I do hope that we can make it everything that the members want it to be. Um, and I think it's a great association. We really you know, it was hard. COVID was hard to have association groups because we couldn't have meetings. And that's the fun part of it is the, the networking and the association. But thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. I laughed and I, I said last year when Gina asked me to run for vice president, I didn't really read the fine print that said, oh, you'll be president. <laughs> yes. I should have thought about that a little bit more. But, but no, I'm happy to do it. And I'm, I'm very glad. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your vote. <laughs> Well, it, it's it's a pleasure, and as 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 one of five or six uh, lifetime awards, I got one from Vet Partners, which was uh, hanging. Well, the, the plaque is right on my wall here in my office, and well, uh, I'm very very proud to be a, a member of so many groups uh, as as now lifetime members. And at my age, I don't have to pay for anything, so <laughs> makes me even better. It really, it, yeah, it really works. Yeah. So Clayton, let's let's start. A uh, back with you know how you got into veterinary medicine and mm -hmm. just tell me you know a little bit about your story. Well, I, as as you uh, covered, uh, I grew up in veterinary medicine, so I was six years old when my father graduated. So I actually remember and and went to a public school that was kitty corner to the vet school uh, in grade six or grade one when I was six years old. Uh, which was uh, very interesting because I would go, we'd come on the same bus to the, to the school. Dad would go to the vet school. I would go to the kindergarten, uh, Kitty Corner, which is now, it's a, now an art gallery, actually. Uh, and uh, then when I was finished, I'd go over and wait in the anatomy lab, which was a strange place with all these animals with, with no skin on them. Or, uh, 
uh, in varied, varied states of, of being torn apart by veterinary students. Uh, so that was, you know, I was there then. My dad, when he graduated, went into artificial insemination, was, was head veterinarian for a, a company called Maple Cattle Breeders at the time. Um, he drove approximately 100,000 miles every year. And the poor car that he had oh my gosh. would, would end up being gone. They, they lasted anywhere from eight, eight months to a year. And then he'd get a new car, which was there. Uh, unfortunately, he had you know, difficulties with that job after. He enjoyed the, the animals, the, the breeding animals that we, we actually lived on, on the uh, unit. Uh, and we had 38 breeding bulls in our backyard almost. Uh, he enjoyed them, but he didn't like handling 30-some technicians all over Ontario. Ontario is a huge province. Uh, and so he would uh, travel from Monday morning at 6 o'clock and get home about 6 o'clock on Friday. Uh, he left that, was head veterinarian for... Uh, um, Maple Leaf Farms for a year, which was also in Maple, and then he uh, opened a, a practice in Whitby, Ontario, which is east of Toronto. Uh, there was no veterinarian in Whitby, uh, and uh, borrowed the money from my uncle, his brother-in-law, uh, who had uh, uh, done very, very well. His, he, he had family money in old Oshawa. So we then went into a mixed practice where dad uh, probably survived on um, uh, doing testing for the fed federal government, uh, TB testing and brucellosis testing at that time uh, to try and, and, and eventually eradicate those diseases uh, within the cattle population. Uh, also did uh, meat inspection, uh, still bred some cows for some of the famous cattle breeders around the Toronto area. They only wanted a veterinarian. They didn't want a technician. And as that work, work slowly dried up, uh, he got into companion animals. He actually built a hospital in 1957, uh, which I realized so many years later. In 1957, there was less than 5% of veterinarians in North America, i.e. the world, that had a separate facility or companion animals. Uh, they, they, they worked out of their house, uh, both practices in, in Oshawa, which was right beside us, had single man practices, and they both lived in their hospital house clinic. Uh, and dad chose to have a building beside that. It was 800 square feet. Uh, that's where I came back to in 1970. I was in school from 64 to 70. And I came back to an 800 square foot hospital with one employee. Uh, and uh, my mother did the evening reception and Saturday, Saturday reception and also did all of the uh, financial bookkeeping. So a very typical uh, veterinary family affair. Uh, and by the time my dad retired, uh, left the practice, I bought him out in 1986. Um, I had four veterinarians, uh, plus myself. We did, uh, I was just looking to hire, I already had a surgeon and I was looking to hire a specialist in internal medicine. Uh, and that didn't come till about 1988. And by that time I had six doctors and 30 employees. And we were one of the first kind of specialty slash general practices. And for those that are not aware in the veterinary profession, they didn't make it uh, long term because you had to either choose to be specialty and then people would refer to you or general uh, and there, you didn't have a referral population. And because we were this hybrid, uh, I suddenly realized probably in the late 80s that that wasn't a great financial model because uh, we were getting no referrals from about 25 miles around us. Uh, and I even offered a, a neighboring practitioner who was building a new uh, practice or a new hospital, said, Brad, pick one. 
you know, if you want general, be general. If you want to be specialty, uh, be specialty and I'll be general. But that never, never really happened. Uh, so it, it uh, was an interesting time. And that's how I ended up going to academia, actually, as a, uh, I'm not sure what the right title was. I was the director of the uh, veterinary teaching hospital at Guelph. And for those that aren't aware, Guelph is the oldest continuously operating veterinary school in North America, uh, has been around since 1864, uh, and was started by a Scot, uh, Andrew Smith, uh, who came to Canada a year after he graduated in Scotland and started the Ontario Veterinary College, which was actually downtown Toronto, not too far from where you and I had, had, had dinner that evening. Um, it was on Front Street in Toronto, uh, was there until, I believe, 1920, before it moved to Guelph. Amazing, amazing. So you would say maybe that first curveball that life threw you was the fact that you had built this hybrid hospital that, and I know what was happening because you're, you're referring or possible referring DVMs were afraid if they sent you customers. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the same thing happened to me when I was managing a general practice that did emergency at night. Yeah, it, it is a fine line to walk. We had, you know, better opportunity with emergency being the only emergency hospital within probably a 30 or 40 minute drive. Right. But, um, you know, especially hospital, you, you know, that's a very planned event for the most part. That would be challenging as a market yeah. person. <laughs> it would be a challenging marketing thing. Well, I think the, the, the thing that I found was the problem was because we, we were very close knit, we shared all our emergencies with the, with the it was uh, started out as a three practice group and then became a six practices, uh, which was very good. Uh, we shared, uh, we actually shared our emergencies on Monday and Tuesday with another practice. And we took theirs on Wednesday and Thursday, and from Friday until Sunday, uh, a practice was on call. One of the six practices was on call. And to me, that was a very working operation that was very successful. Uh, but after I left practice and went to academia, they decided to open a, an emergency clinic. And it actually ended up being in my neighbor's X practice when he moved and built a new place, uh, they took his old place and made that the emergency clinic. I can remember going to the meeting and saying, that's in whose benefit is that? Because it, it actually didn't benefit the public because they now had to pay amazing <laughs> fees in my estimation uh, and then be referred back to wherever they were going on Monday. Uh, and by then, they may not have had any money. And I still think that that's a problem. That model that you're talking about was a really common model when I first started working in practice. You didn't really have a standalone emergency clinic. Uh, groups of practices collaborated together to have each other's call. And, you, mm -hmm. and it goes back to kind of that where we were much more agricultural based um, mm -hmm. early, early on. And we had a, a model that would be more like a, a mixed animal or large animal practice where you came back in and you did your emergencies. And then as it, as it kind of morphed over into more small animal, then that's where you saw the specialty hospitals, the emergency hospitals becoming standalone uh, hospitals out there in the world because the day practitioners were like, I'm done, especially in small rural communities because they were mm -hmm all the time. There was never a break for them. They would have an answering service and um, then they would, you know, have to go out on call. And, you know, even when we opened an emergency practice in Reedsville, North Carolina, and we had um, some hospitals who still said, no, I still want to take my own emergencies and I'm not going to send people to you. And that certainly was an option, but it, it does burn your veterinarians out when you're the only one in your practice and you're doing all that. So it's, it's a completely different time now. Um, so tell me about, you know, like how you came from a, a, academia and into your position at Hills. 
Well, the, the I, I ended up going to academia because when uh, I, I bought my father out of the practice, our family home was right in front of it. Uh, and um, although we only used a very tiny part of it, what used to be a, uh, I guess, a family room at the back of the house that overlooked the clinic, um, once my mom and dad uh, retired and left the practice, they spent summers on Lake Huron and winters in Daytona. So they were in the house maybe two weeks a year. And I, after about the third year, I said to my dad, this isn't really working for me. I have to look after this house property uh, with nobody in it for 50, 50 weeks a year. You know, could I change it into part of the practice? And they agreed uh, that that would be okay. So I took that home and turned it into my outpatient practice. So it had five exam rooms on the main floor. Uh, we did a, uh, a, a walkway, heated walkway for the winter because we have snow and ice. Uh, we had to be, of course, accessible to everyone at that time. Things, the building codes had all changed. Uh, so we put in this ramp and, and walkway up the side that wheelchairs could uh, make their access right into 700 square feet of retail uh, and reception, uh, then five exam rooms, uh, an office for the veterinarians at the back, uh, and a kitchen area for the staff to uh, eat in. And then upstairs, we had business offices and two of the bedrooms and the third and fourth bedroom were made. And I took the roof up and, and had a, a 40 seat conference room. So a very different building. The basement was entirely uh, our central supply. Uh, so things came in there on rollers, just like a grocery store uh, for, as they were delivered. And then there was an employee in central supply. And that was her entire job was to look after central supply. We even had a, a uh, we found out never call anything when you're building, you never call anything an elevator because the elevators cost forty to fifty thousand dollars, but if it's a dumb waiter, uh, you can put it in for about eight, yeah, for about eight thousand dollars. And so we had a dumb waiter to the main floor for all the heavy uh, pet foods and things that we were selling at the time, and we we were very successful at that. Uh, we also had the forty C conference room, which the veterinarians of the of the area met there, the technicians of the area met there, uh, and uh, we did our education of our clients there. Well, it sounds to me like you've always been really interested in education if you built a conference room there. Personally, that you have been involved in the American Animal Hospital Association and you know educational offerings for them uh, too. Mm -hmm. so, you have this really successful practice. How scary is it to say, I believe in all this, you know, this is my childhood home. I'm, I'm going to take off and I'm going to go to university. Well, it, it, it was, and, and uh, my brother-in-law is, 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 and was uh, the, the head of a major, um, I'm not sure what the right word for, for, for George's business was, but he, he hired people. Uh, and what was was George Ends and partner? Uh, he uh, what he began. He's so famous in the collection business or whatever they call it uh, at the time. And so I always had George there to go and say, well, I don't, now I'm thinking about going to uh, become the director of the veterinary teaching hospital. And his advice was that was the dumbest thing I'd ever thought of. <laughs> Uh, which was always great about having someone like that. You know, he said, you're going to go from a place where you're the boss who runs the show and what you decide is is going to be done in most cases. And you're going to go to a place where you have to get concessions from everybody. And academia is probably the the least group that, that gets along with one another, unfortunately. Uh, when I went there, uh, being a director of... of a section of a teaching hospital is more than 50% of the budget for the entire veterinary college. 
And so it's it's quite a position. You're on Dean's Council, so, so you're there with all the other heads of department. Uh, and it was a very challenging job. Uh, I learned a lot, but I did not enjoy. Uh, I, I've made no secret that academia, 20% of the people in academia are the smartest, hardest working people I've ever met in my life. I have never uh, seen people work and, and be uh, so self-effacing to what they were doing and what they provided. The middle was the middle that's there in every place. Unfortunately, in academia, there's 20% that are the worst people I've ever dealt with who, who tried to sabotage things because they weren't there or they didn't agree. Uh, and, and that just doesn't work for me. Uh, I'm too much of a team player and having 20% of the folks that were supposed to be adjunct to, my, to, to what I was doing was, was very difficult and hard on me both physically and mentally. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I saw as a, a director of the teaching hospital was students, undergraduates, which is really, I felt, the major part. Yes, we have graduate students as well, but we really get, in, in my case, I, we were, I was getting over a million dollars from the provincial government to produce young, new veterinarians, not to produce graduate students. Uh, and so that was the way I began to lean more and more that that's what I should be concentrating on was the teaching. But I noticed that it's all being taught by specialists. Mm -hmm. And that changed the game for me because I was taught by ex-practitioners. There were no specialties in 1966 when I started veterinary school and there wasn't any when I left. Now, that was my entire staff. I had I I was the only veterinarian in the teaching hospital. Everybody else was an internist or a neurologist or a cardiologist or an ophthalmologist uh, as veterinarians, and and some of them did a remarkable job, and others were so into their their specialty. Uh, that their knowledge was, as I described it, two inches wide and a mile and a half deep. That is not what a young 19, 20-year-old veterinary student needs uh, in, from a teaching point of view. Yeah. Well, I've been doing some work with North Carolina State, and my goal is to have a veterinary practice management certificate in the undergrad um, mm. program, the pre-vet program. And I think we've been working on it for five years and it, we actually got it launched. And because of lack of communication between the departments, we didn't have enough enrollment the second semester to, to keep it going. Although there was a tremendous amount of interest from the students, but they just didn't realize it was even there. So now we're trying to do it as an online certificate. And quite honestly, I would pull my hair out if I had to work in academia, going through the channels, going through the changes in department heads, going through all the rules that require, for this program, they require uh, advanced degrees. And so mm -hmm. even though I have been consulting, managing hospitals for 23 years, I'm a certified veterinary practice manager, I cannot teach this program mm -hmm. because I don't have an MBA. Mm -hmm. so we have to find, we, we actually found a veterinarian that we will put this program underneath her uh, credentialing. But it, it's, your point is so accurate in that um, when a lot of veterinary students come out and they want to go into general practice, uh, everything is a zebra and nothing is a horse. And, and I've seen that many, many times in my career where there's a lack of practical knowledge and experience. And I think the veterinary schools here are doing a better job now with their community clinics so that they're actually getting into what I would call a general day practice and seeing hot spots and itchy dogs and fleas and things like that, um, as opposed to looking at, you know, major types of cancer and, and incredible surgeries and all the things that can be done by specialty hospitals and are so impressive to me, but but you don't really practice that way 90% of the time, you know, so no. we need to, we need to have a realistic view of what it is like to practice. 
know, the other thing, and I think you mentioned this earlier, is is efficient in practice. And in veterinary schools, from my experience in my visits, there don't seem to be enough technicians to do technician work. And so veterinary students do not learn how to appropriately leverage technicians because they're used as technicians when they're in school. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, if we're going to have a shortage of veterinarians and we, you know, depending on who you're listening to, we do, we also are very inefficient at this point in time. Right. All our habits have been broken and we, you know, this curbside has slowed us down and all the protocols have slowed us down. Um, we also need to, to learn to dance together better. And it, you can't learn to dance with one partner in one building and another partner in another building. So I think one of the, the wise moves that some schools are doing is combining technician school with veterinary school and letting them learn together. Uh, how who's supposed to do what in this dance step of um, partnership? Um, I think I mean that the the issue and when you look at it and and because of my age and how long I've been around, technician schools were basically founded in the late '60s, and in our case, they were all funded by government, uh, and there was only two of them in Ontario at the time and they were primarily set up to be to help large animal practitioners and they were almost all male uh, as their student body because they were going to uh, you know become the, the 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 person who threw that cow on the floor or whatever they did uh, but that never turned out that way because large animal practitioners wouldn't use them uh, and so it switched then to a primarily female role uh, as companion animals began to open up everywhere. And unfortunately, our profession as veterinarians didn't honor those people with the kind of work that they should have been doing. Instead, instead they turned or tried to turn them into, you know, part of the cleaning crew that washed the floor and did the windows and, and you know, maybe sterilize some instruments, but other than that, they weren't used in the roles that they should have been used in. And, and it was something that I learned very early in, in my career because I watched what happened in good practices around me uh, and, and at the university where technicians were actually valued. Uh, and my first technician, uh, Sue Day, was with me for, well, I left 14 years before she did. Uh, and she, she was an amazing lady who started out, you know, in this one doc, two doctor practice, and she was the only uh, technician in a, in a smaller building than we ever should have been trying to operate out of. Uh, and then we rebuilt the new practice to 33, 33 or 3,300 square feet in 74. Uh, and now she actually could do more of the things, and we hired another technician. Uh, I think we eventually, by the time I, I learned a new management technique uh, in the early 80s, which meant I managed, but with the number of employees we now had, we needed somebody running the technician program, somebody running uh, the... the uh, uh, reception group, uh, because we had a, a lot of those, uh, and somebody running the veterinary assistance group or, or just the, the people that were doing the cleaning. And so I said, I forget who it was that, that gave me the advice. It was at an aha meeting somewhere who said, you know, you shouldn't be hiring those people. Uh, the head, you should have a head of each of those departments who hire the people. Uh, and he or she went on to explain that was because they should be their employees, not yours. Because it, I'm sure you've found that in practices that you've, you've worked with, that you go in and the receptionists are all saying, you know, the latest Dumbo you just hired <laughs> is really not very good. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and so once you said, okay, 
we're going to have three heads of departments and you will do the hiring and they will be your employees. Uh, that was a very different operation. Uh, and uh, in one case, in our case, with the receptionist, they picked as the head receptionist actually the, 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 the most kind lady that worked in my practice for 20 some years. She originally came from Trinidad and Jean couldn't say no to anybody. So she ended up being on the desk all the time <laughs> while the others were taking time off. Uh, and eventually we had to say, okay, you had your opportunity. We will now pick who's the head and we hired somebody from the outside from the retail business. It's just that way that it's there that the technicians, uh, to finish that story, they picked the youngest technician who had just started as their new head. Sue Day, who was my longest uh, employee by then, was probably 14 or 15 or no, 18 years in, in our place. She came to me and said, I want no part of that. I, I don't want to go up and be in that new building and talk to people. I don't like doing that. I want to be out here and I'll manage the surgery uh, and emergency work and all the things that I have to do. I'd, I'd love to do that. And I said, well, you realize that that's taking you out of, of how, how quickly you're going to get raises based on cost of living. But unless something changes for how you work out there, there's no more. Uh, and she said, that's fine by me. Uh, that's what I want to do. I just want to. And she was a tremendous aide once uh, my wife ended up being the hospital director. And she would take new veterinarians under her wing and and get them say, no, 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 everybody has to do surgery here. This is not, well, I don't, I don't do that. Uh, yes, you do. And here's all, I'm going to help you do it. There's a great deal of, of fear, I think, that's overcoming that. So I'm going to ask you, like looking back over your career, you obviously have changed, you know, I think going from academia to working for a large corporate group, you know, as big as Hills, I'm like, wow, that's significant change. And then back and, and well, see, I had my brother-in-law there again when I was changing jobs. Uh, and and he, he wasn't as opposed to me going to corporate, but he was very wise in what he said. And he, he said, you know, when you're going to do that, because Hills is a, an American company and I'm a Canadian. Uh, and he said, you know, you really should go into the negotiation for your new job. They came to me. We would like... Uh, uh, director of Veterinary Affairs in Canada. We've never had that position before. Uh, and I'd worked with them uh, through my AHA years uh, and used them as a sponsor for several of my speaking engagements. So I was well aware of who they were and, and talking to them. And so uh, the nice relationship, but he said, you got to go in and you must have what you want because they will have wants as well. So I went in with a list of seven things uh, that I had to have. And uh, fortunately, I got six of them. The seventh one was being paid in American funds, which didn't happen, but, but it was a nice try. Hey, the answer is always no if you don't ask. And this is That's right. But the rest, the rest went well. Uh, I, I enjoyed that. And the, the, the real turning point in, in becoming the director of veterinary affairs, they kept trying to give me employees all the time. I'd had uh, 140 employees at, at the teaching hospital uh, managed by a team of six of us. But basically, the, I was responsible for all of them. Uh, and so I was very nervous about taking anybody. I eventually took an admin assistant who was very helpful and did my travel and did whatever. Uh, but the other veterinarians that I was involved with that worked in, in the Canadian operation, I helped hire them, but they all worked for sales and I wasn't responsible for how they worked. But the, the, the real thing came along in about three years or four years after uh, there was a change in, in, in Topeka, uh, our, our home office, uh, and they a, the head of veterinary affairs, uh, a mentor of mine, and one you probably know, Jack Mara, uh, developed can cancer uh, and was talking about retirement. And so they wanted to have someone to follow behind Jack. 
uh, and that never really went anywhere. They eventually hired a young man who was a speaker uh, who was quite good. And I remember the president coming to Toronto uh, saying, well, we've hired this young man. And I said, well, that's great. Good for you. And, and it's, I'm glad you found someone. Um, but nobody's going to know who he is for at least three to five years. <laughs> that's very difficult. He, he's not, he doesn't have any shoulder pads yet. Uh, he only lasted uh, about three, about eight months uh, and left. Uh, and then they asked me and said, uh, would you come down and take over the director of veterinary affairs for the US? Uh, Jack had left by then. And uh, so I came home and talked to my wife as, as I should, as someone said, the reason you've been married for 53 years is you learned that the secret is two words, yes, dear. And I came home and talked to Mary Lynn and, and she wasn't very happy when I'd left practice. And then uh, four years after that, we're leaving and I'm taking a new job, uh, and, which meant travel all the time. We, we settled near the airport because I had to be there more often than I went to the office. Uh, and then I'm offered the job in the United States to be head of veterinary affairs and we moved to Topeka. <laughs> and so I had this long late night chat with her and she said, you do whatever you want. If that's where you want to go and that's where you want to settle, you get an apartment down there. And whenever you can come home, because you're going to travel way more than you do now in a much, you know, 10 times the population, you're going to be everywhere. Uh, and that's, I knew that that was factual. And she finished her, her statement by saying, and my name's not Dorothy and I don't have red shoes and I'm not going to Topeka. <laughs> which, which is, you know, the, the, the story of the Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. And it was very factual. And so I turned it down and stayed here in the rest of my career. And, and indeed that was one of the best moves that ever happened to me. Uh, to stay, as, as the saying goes, the big frog in a small pond rather than a tiny frog or a pollywog in a huge pond. Uh, so it, it was great advice and I've always thanked her for it. So Clayton, looking back on your career and the changes and stuff, what was the biggest mistake you think you ever made? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think about that periodically. I'm, I'm not really sure that I've ever made a mistake but I also didn't have any great path in, in my decision. Uh, I lived in a veterinary practice. I probably went to veterinary school because I already knew what was going on. Uh, I'd never planned to go back and practice with my dad. That was not on my radar when I first started veterinary school. In fact, I was very turned on by the animal welfare movement. Uh, and particularly by, at that time, a, a man named Tom Hughes, who was head of the Ontario Humane Society. But I realized that in first year, there was no uh, place for veterinarians in the animal welfare movement. There was no jobs there. Uh, so you, you wouldn't be able to buy the things you wanted, or maybe a house or anything, because it was primarily a voluntary position. And so I looked very seriously at what I could do with my veterinary education uh, in first and early second year. Uh, and I discovered there was only one veterinary lawyer in, in the United States. There was none in Canada. And so I semi-planned at that time to finish my veterinary degree, go on and take a law degree, and then go to the United States. Uh, where I I plan to work in equine equine insurance because unfortunately so often those with that kind of money buy a million dollar colt that I can beat to the corner <laughs> and and that shouldn't happen and so that colt ends up with a broken leg in a barn with a baseball bat uh, and or is electrocuted somehow. Uh, it, it was a very nasty look at the underbelly of, of what people do to animals. Uh, and that was, that was sort of my original plan. 
but as things happened, I fell in love. I had two kids by the time I, I was ready to go and I had four miles to feed. So I went back to practice. Yeah, sometimes life just the, puts things in front of you and you kind of look back and go, well, you know, I didn't really think about it at the time. It wasn't this big, you know, life altering decision. I just kind of fell into it. And I think mm-hmm. that happens to a lot of us just during, you know, life circumstances. And, and fortunately for you, you, you did have your brother-in-law who was giving yes. advice along the way. And obviously your wife, who said she wasn't moving to Kansas, um, right. you mentioned, um, you know, knowing people. And, and so for you and I both, we know a lot of people in the veterinary profession. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on networking and how that has been beneficial to your career. Networking is, is, is I, I'm not sure how those that don't do it very well make it uh, because you learn so much from people who you meet uh, in other lines of work or your own area. I mean, when I went to uh, get involved with the American Animal Hospital Association was in 1980, and I became their first Canadian president. I think AHA started in 1933. And so I became their first president uh, that didn't live in the United States in 1995, 96, 63 years later. Uh, and the people that I met in the American Animal Hospital Association, I became an area director in 1980. I'd become a, a member and built a practice to their standards in 1974. The, the amount of, of knowledge that People had the fellows like I, like Larry Deep that came is probably one of the most famous veterinarians ever from Florida, uh, and his whole family was well known in the veterinary profession. Two brothers and a father, Harv Johnson from Des Moines, Iowa. I mean, I met people from all over Canada and the United States uh, in my own business who had some fascinating things to tell me uh, when I. Got in, got involved with academia. The same situation. I met academics from from all the schools. In fact, we had a meeting of the hospital directors once a year in Atlanta. Uh, vet partners was that way uh, to get involved early. I was probably joined the very first year it was in existence, and and as much as I could deal with it too often, I was around it enough to meet the people that I. I needed to meet or wanted to meet. Uh, there, there are just so many that you did. Uh, the Toronto Academy, uh, which has you know been around since the 30s uh, in Toronto, is the most interesting organization. It's struggling to stay alive now, as most organizations are, unfortunately. Uh, but in my era, when I first graduated in 1970, they wanted me to become involved right away, and I said. I'm trying to start my new profession here. I don't have a lot of time. Well, what could you do? And I said, well, I I, I speak well enough. Uh, I'd be happy to introduce speakers. And they said, oh, that's wonderful. Most of us don't like being on stage or talking talking to anybody. So if you'd come and do that, and I I met well, you know, on my desk, I have Clay Turtle. It was given to me in 1984, I believe, by Carl Osborne. And Carl Osborne uh, was uh, the co-founder, I assume, of, of, of CD uh, in, as far as cats that were plugged. And he and, he and Mark Morris Jr. developed the, the formulas to make the original products. Uh, and at his, he never retired because he ended up with Parkinson's disease, and he had this plaque made for for for. He invited 300 of his best friends to a non-retirement party in Minnesota. We went, and this is a brick from the old small animal clinic that he served in, uh, and they were tearing it down. and And uh, Jody Lulich, who was who was a mentor, mentee of Carl's. Uh, Carl couldn't handle his little buggy, the electronic buggy that he traveled around in because of his Parkinson's. And so he told <laughs> told Jody to go out and break up all these bricks so he could put these plaques on it. 
and invite people to his non-retirement party, which was December 9th, 2011. And he invited up on stage himself, sitting on his little electric thing, everybody that was there, there was about 200 of us. And this is, this is to Clayton McKay, an appreciation of caring about others. What we do for ourselves dies with us. What we do for others lives on. That's Carl. I love that. I love that. And I agree with it. And I, I met him as a speaker yeah. Yeah. in 1970. Uh, I met, uh, what's his name? The, the guy that wrote all the, uh, Danny Scott, one of the original uh, dermatologists who wrote everything. I met Danny, and Danny was the most original guy I'd ever met in those days. I came down and I'm there with my suit on and already uh, to, to meet, and I was setting up the room because nobody was there yet. And there's a guy in a, in a purple t-shirt, jeans and sandals, walked into the room. And I went over to say, you know, you're not in the right room. But he, he left too quickly. So then everybody else came in. In those days, it was primarily all men. And they all came in with their jackets and suits on. And then suddenly this guy with the t-shirt <laughs> and the sandals is back in. And I went over and said, excuse me, I think you're in the wrong room. And he said, I'm Danny Scott. Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, you know, I've known, you know, people like that, the head of the Animal Medical Center in New York City, you know, just so many people that I got to know over the years it was. Well, I think that network networking is is what I love, and and it's it's today what? I still talk to people that. Um, putting yourself at I, in I, haven't seen. I think that you know to to think about you know well I can introduce the speakers and most people oh we hate to we hate to speak in public because most people would rather face death than. <laughs> speak in public yes. <laughs> so, so to put yourself out there and to realize that um the opportunity comes along from humans i mean other people are the are how we get our opportunities out there and knowing knowing people um i i'm always you know me i'm always fascinated with people and i actually spoke at aha's connexity this year and i gave a class on how to talk to strangers and uh, it was a fascinating thing and, and dr vogel saying when we were talking about it she said you know deb i don't think my 17 year old kid knows how to do that would know how to just right. have a conversation with a stranger and i said well i think that is it's so important to the ability of us to grow our careers and just to learn from other people uh, because people are fascinating. People know stuff, you know, and they know cool stuff. So uh, talking to strangers, I laughed in this that I talk to people on airplanes and everybody went, uh, <laughs> you don't know who I've met on these airplanes. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just, just making the effort to step out of your comfort zone and say, tell me about you. You know, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I will say, and you probably don't, do this either. I don't tell people what I do for a living because if I'm on an airplane, that means I have two hours of dog and cat pictures to look at on their phone when we're sitting here kind of trapped on the airplane. Um, somebody said, well, what do you, what if you can't get away from somebody or you don't want to talk to somebody? I said, tell me work for the IRS and you will have to worry about it. I think at another AHA meeting, I remember one of the guest speakers we had was, was a, a comedian. Uh, and he he after had uh, a little booth where he sold his books and and did all those kinds of things. So I was quite interested in what he had to say. And I went over and and I told him stories that you know it's very difficult as a veterinarian when you travel as as I do. Uh, I'm like you. I've got to, I got to prepare what I'm going to say at the next place. And this is a workspace for me. So talking to people is not what I do on airplanes in those days and uh and he said i've got just the thing for you and he hands me this little book cover and he said whatever book you're reading just slip this on it and, and when you go to get on what do you do when you get on an airplane i said i always put my stuff up and my jacket and and get ready and get ready to work and he said before you do all that take take this now covered book out and set it on the seat 
And on this book cover, it said, how to talk to people on airplanes about insurance. <laughs> he said, not only will they not talk to you, they won't even make eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> I can see right now, hundreds of people going out to make this book cover. Yeah. Whatever they're uh, reading is going to be <laughs> <laughs> sell insurance. It um, works. It works. Oh, that's hysterical. Um, so Clayton, looking back on a, a very long and illustrious career, what career advice would you give to somebody who was, you know, we, we were talking about this before we started to record. Uh, there's a huge amount of people who are considering changing jobs this next year. 41% of the American population, 38% of the UK and Ireland population are considering or pretty sure they're going to quit their job in this next year. So it's not just about veterinary medicine. This is a universal step back by the entire world population that says, I'm going to take a look at what I'm doing for a living and I'm going to change it to something I really enjoy. In, and so what, what advice would you give them uh, in making these career decisions? The career decisions are, are very difficult, but what we've talked about basically is, is first of all, that veterinary medicine is not an animal business. It's a people business. Uh, and so if you end up in veterinary medicine because it's all about the animals and you, you don't include the people, uh, you're going to find it very difficult to survive. Uh, I've always asked the question when I'm speaking to a veterinary audience, who is the most important part of your animal health care team? And they say, well, the technician and the veterinarian and this receptionist. It's the owner. The owner has the animal in its possession 97% of the time. You see it less than 3% of its life. And so if you don't bond with that owner, you don't, you probably are not going to bond with that client. Uh, and they're either, if they're coming back to you, uh, you're lucky. Uh, they probably are, are going to find somebody else. Uh, and and that is so, so true. And it, it's even true. It's quite interesting, the, the, the uh, uh, large animal folks, uh, how much better they get along with their clients and how you have way less complaints uh, from the large animal field because the farmer either likes you or doesn't like you. And they're either going to, you're either going to become a long-term client or not at all. Uh, and so most large animal people uh, don't have the stresses and strains of the companion animal people who are continually getting beat up online and on social media. Uh, I, I do some consulting and that's a big part of the issue when things fall apart and how do you deal with that? Uh, so you know, the, the, it's a people business. You, you need to understand going in, and, and I'm quite interested in what you said about uh, your trying to get a class started. All too often, veterinary students are not interested in what's going on if it isn't animal related, and they don't, they don't make that when, when, and I forget her name now, who came to Guelph, she's one of, known as one of the best communicators, and her whole issue was communication. She's now in Calgary again, uh, and she came, there was no place for her. She had no status in Guelph at all, and they found her a little office upstairs and eventually found some budget for her, and she got to the point where she began to teach communications to veterinary students, and she came to me, and I'd left by then uh, after, and she said, I'm so frustrated with this because the students are all unhappy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, yep. because there was no animal stuff. She didn't bring a cow or anything into the room, uh, and they couldn't understand that, why communication would be the least bit important. And, and from the point of view of an animal, if you can't communicate, the owner controls what's going on, not you. Uh, and so if you don't get along with the owner, the patient never has a hope. No, not at all. I agree 100%. And, of course, for me, I've been training communication 
in customer service for 16 yeah. years now. And you're right. I mean, the managers come, the technicians come, the receptionists come, and the veterinarians don't come. And I'm like, you are the one who's causing the most stress in the hospital because of your lack of communication. Right. And also the one who has got to be the highest authority to convince this owner to do whatever it is, you know, because you have the clout. But if you don't do it well, the animal never gets the care. It never right. does. And so we have got to make sure that we're communicating well and that, like you said, we are partners with the veterinarian uh, client, the veterinary client. Uh, we are not the authority. And I think as we get more and more millennial generation pet owners who are looking at these animals, not as utilitarian, which is where we grew up, mm -hmm. but they, these are family. These are children. We are furry children, pediatricians. Mm -hmm. and we've got to be able to communicate with the people in our world and the people, you know, I used to hire people and they'd say, Oh, you know, I love animals. Why do you want to be in veterinary medicine? Because I don't like people. I went, well, you're in the wrong profession. Exactly. Because yeah, attached to every one of those leads, leashes, halters, cat boxes is a person carrying mm -hmm. them in is the, who is the decision maker as to whether you actually get to do your work or not. Um, I, you know, I love what you said about the large animal guys, because it's true. I mean, manage the mixed animal practice. The farmers, you're right. They do either like you or want, and if they don't like you, they're just not going to call you to come out. But the other thing that farmers do is they are also well-versed in animal health. They understand that this is their livelihood. They, they teach themselves or they are accepting of information from their veterinarians because they want to keep these animals alive their purpose you know for whatever their purpose is and i find that companion animals sometimes we assume as veterinary professionals that companion animal owners have that same base knowledge that large animal owners do mm -hmm. and we approach it that way and the problem is they don't we talk over their heads they leave confused upset they write nasty reviews and we're astounded that we didn't explain things to them the way they, you know, we, it made perfect sense to us while we were explaining these things. So I think you're exactly right about that. Well, Clayton, let's, uh, let's end this uh, great conversation. I appreciate your time. Tell us a fun fact about you. Do you have a secret talent? Do you have a <laughs> um, so well, when I saw, when I saw that on your note, uh, <laughs> I think from from a, a largely American audience, uh, the secret is I'm a curler. That you know, curling. I, you know that I saw curling. And, and <laughs> until until a few years ago, when it was begun on the Olympics, uh, Americans didn't know anything about curling. And in 1983, uh, my wife and I were supposed to go to a Naha meeting in. Texas, and I've forgotten like, Dallas or whenever, and and I that's the only AHA meeting I missed uh, until COVID. That year we won Ontario uh, in, in curling and went to the uh, national championships on the East Coast in uh, Saint John, New Brunswick, and that's a huge deal in Canada, but. At that time, all my American friends had no idea. And so when I didn't show up at the meeting, uh, I think John McCarthy was retiring that year or was the president who would then retire shortly thereafter. Uh, and so they wrote me up in, in the AHA little newsletter at the time. And the, the write-up was a scream. I, in fact, took the write-up. It was so funny to me. Uh, and to curlers, I took it to the Ontario Curling Association meeting and was allowed to read it to everyone. And they used, I think, 12 different compar sport comparisons to try and explain it to the average American, what curling even was. And it's very hard to imagine, you know, a sport where you're throwing a 44 pound granite rock down a sheet of ice and you're using brooms to sweep in front of it, why that has any sense to anybody. It is, it, you know, it, I'm truly, if we hadn't seen it in the, in the Winter Olympics, I think none of us would have, would have thought that it was any kind of sport to it. We're like, really? A broom? A rock? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you've got to look back at some of these sports and like, how did this even start? Like how, you know, where is the origin of curling? Mm -hmm. 
you got to think, well, there's a long, a lot of long, cold Canadian winters, and you're trying to find something to amuse yourself with. And somebody figured out one day that this worked and that you could race it to see who could do it the best. Well, it came from either Scotland or and or Holland way back before uh, uh, we white people came to this uh, continent. And then in Canada, people just don't realize there are more curlers in Canada than there is in the rest of the world combined. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's really taken over here and you can tell how long our winters are. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, as someone who's never been on a set of ice skates, I, I uh, <laughs> and, and who lives in the South intentionally because I right. old, <laughs> I'm just going to watch it on TV and yes. be amazed at the, at the sweeping that goes in there. Um, any favorite books, anything else you'd like? Well, I just, when I, when I mentioned that, I've got, what I'm reading at the moment is The Spy and the Traitor, which is the story of, of Oleg uh, Gordovetsky. Uh, who was a KGB officer. It's a real story. Uh, and, and we have our book club here in the condo Thursday night. So I've got to get through that. And I'm also reading another, this is uh, Kate Quinn and the Rose Code, uh, which is a spy love story, which is kind of neat. And, and uh, so I'm into things with spies and stuff. And not weird stuff, but yeah. The, the, and and truth truth by stories yeah you know, yeah some people think that we um, you know we there are people out there who do the kind of work and I'm glad that they do that kind of work but I really don't want to know how many times they intercept something that could have been so disastrous to us and I know that it probably happens on a daily basis that we don't mm. know about so you know a big thank you to those people who do that kind of work and great appreciation uh, but don't tell me what you did you know <laughs> exactly. I would prefer to live in my glass bubble here and not uh, not be concerned. Well, Clayton, thank you so much for your time today. It's always a pleasure to hang out with you some and talk about you know um, our long history in veterinary medicine. Yours longer than mine. I started my first job in 1985. Went to NC uh-huh. earlier than that for pre vet animal science degree and uh, have been in it ever since. But um, you win when it comes to the length of, of veterinary knowledge and uh, history of the profession. So thank you very much for your time today. And uh, hopefully you'll see you at uh, Vet Partners meeting. Hey, it's going to be in Orlando. It's warm. I, I hope that I, I get to travel again. Uh, we're kind of staying close to home because of COVID. It's this uh, part of veterinary medicine, getting to know somebody like you, that has meant such a big deal to me. Um, it's it's the people associations that I have met in uh, in what has been a long career. Uh, it's now 53 years, I think, uh, and uh, of, of just being a veterinarian, and and the rest of it I consider veterinary related anyway. So it, I just feel privileged uh, to be allowed to do that, uh, and uh, thank you. This has been a great opportunity for me to remember some stuff I I wish my memory was better. Well, I think, you know, one thing we can both say to people about veterinary medicine is it'll be okay. You know, it's a, it's a long and valued profession. People appreciate the work that we do and they love their animals. They're going to continue to love those animals and we will have jobs in the future, but we're going to have to continue to move uh, probably a little more rapidly than we did in the past in order to satisfy our consumer of the modern age. So uh, yep, it's changing. It's changing so quickly, the world uh, that we have to change with it. Well, thank you again, Clayton. And thank you everyone for listening to us today on The Bend. We hope that you've got some great information and um, that you enjoyed listening to our illustrious guest, Dr. Clayton McKay. And you can, you're welcome to give them my uh, email address should they uh, need, need or want or just want to hear some more. Yeah, all these things will be in the show notes. So right. you'll have all of Clayton's contact information and his uh, nine page bio. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bother reading that. Thank you, Clayton, again. Bye, Deb.